Blessing or a curse is a, is a presentation I've developed on wastewater regulation harmonization in, in the Canadian North. It started out as an intent by the Government of Canada to try and harmonize the regulation of wastewater across Canada. That's east, west and north, south. The, the problem with that is that the wastewater treatment in the far north is a much different set of dynamics in terms of the natural environment, in terms of the communities, the culture, the distances. So this was, is a discussion of where the, the harmonization is, is a good thing and potentially a bad thing for communities and people who work in the north. Wastewater sampling points is a really significant part of the overall harmonization because if you're going to have a regulation, you actually have to sample from that point of discharge and take that sample down to a laboratory that can test and then record the, uh, the effluent quality from the, the lab work. What has been a really issue for in northern Canada is the identification and the accessibility of these points for the wastewater systems that operate in northern Canada. As you can see on the slide is that the there's only access at this time to 53, just over 50% of this of the sampling points in these northern communities and and 20% of them have no access and uh, the other ones have to do things like a long access walk to the point and, and have to have specific either um, boat or helicopter access. So in terms of the actual application of, of the regulation, these the accessibility is really a, a significant I guess downside of the of the overall water and sewer harmonization. The transportation of these water samples, once you've then collected them, is actually a difficult issue. As you can see on the uh, the one slide, this was a, 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 a timeline of taking a slide from the community of Greece Fjord, which is up very high in the, in the Canadian north, and taking it down to a laboratory in, in I think it's, it's Yellowknife. And you can see over the timeline as this, this is actually an exercise that took over almost five days. And of course, with wastewater samples to keep them within the laboratory criteria, you have to get them generally within 48 hours. So you've got this timeline reality that is again doesn't support having these harmonized wastewater regulations. In terms of a blessing side of the overall harmonization is that the intent of this uh, of the harmonization is to actually have what I call a one-stop shop. So in terms of a, a regulatory the, the regulatory influences to wastewater treatment you would have sort of one particular portal that you would go into and have all your discussions. It has been sort of characteristically in the past that wastewater regulation would be handled by several different, I call it entities, whether it be a water board, which is an overall board of lay people that reviews potentially or reviews water and sanitation projects. And you'd also have other government departments, whether they be at the territorial level or at the federal level. So you'd have potentially four or five masters in this overall process but with the harmonization there is this opportunity to have one portal where you you would submit your project at one place and have the decision making taking place through that one conversation as opposed to individual conversations another very positive aspect of this harmonization that has taken place over the last 15 years is that there has been a lot of research associated with to really find out how northern wastewater systems can be or are, are characterized differently from systems that might offer that might operate in southern Canada again with the, particularly with the climate and the um, geography is that it's a, a very dis unique set of criteria for how biology works in the far north so this degree of additional degree of research that has taken place has provided I can't say it's even filled the gap because generally wastewater research in northern Canada has been I, I, not quite absent but very very limited probably over the last 30 years so there was certainly an increase in that I think that that is added to making the harmonization potentially more valuable but also just have, adding to the science and ultimately the engineering or applied science of wastewater treatment in the, the far north and of course another blessing is with, associated with the research is, is the consulting industry there has certainly been a 
a large amount of consulting related activity associated with wastewater systems in the far north over the last 15 years and recognizing that if, if you're going to um, have additional science you need additional engineering related work in terms of sampling in terms of how these systems should be designed from a geotechnical perspective so this has added a, a vast degree of work and additional knowledge to systems in the far north the dialogue with the regulators as, as part of this i call it the one-stop shop is that they the dialogues have been much um more frequent and more direct as as the harmonization opportunity has advanced so that the regulators as part of their responsibility for harmonization have been having i guess more frequent and, and probably more extensive dialogues with whether it be the communities or the consultants or the the governments that are actually the territorial governments that are actually building these systems so, so these dialogues have become much more frequent and much more i guess intensive so that the regulators are aware of the potential shortfalls in the process technology that may not that may not meet the ultimately meet the criteria but at the same time they gain an under the the communities gain a better understanding of what is expected from them so there is not there's probably the opportunity for less I call it conflict or, or less opportunity to have disagreements once the facility is constructed if you have this advanced related work. A curse on the curse side of it in terms of a negative thing is that places like the town of Anubik in above the Arctic Circle, they actually have a primary, secondary and a lagoon system, which in principle is actually a fairly comprehensive or, or extensive sewage treatment system, but this system would not necessarily consistently meet the harmonization effluent criteria, which are, have, been, have been pegged now at 25 milligrams per liter BO, BOD and 25 milligrams per liter suspended solid, solids. So within Anuvik's compliance related framework for their water license, which governs what they do with their wastewater or how they've treated, they, they have this provision that they must strive to make improvements. Now, to make improvements in their lagoon system, I mean, I suppose the, the ultimately it could require a replacement of it with a mechanical system, which would be, be worth tens of millions of dollars and would require millions of dollars in terms of operation or some other supplementary system to their lagoon system they have in place now. So this has created really a, a, a stress for the community in terms of their capital funding and ultimately O&M by having these um, harmonization rules in place. For the village of Fort Simpson is that they're in a situation that they're on an island so they have very limited terrain so they in fact have had the development of a mechanical system that was originally developed now almost 30 years ago but which is is an interesting circumstance of their discharge systems that they discharge directly into the Mackenzie River, which in fact, in terms of a dilution rate or dispersion rate, they have about a 300,000 to one dilution rate with the discharge into the Mackenzie River. And that has been, I guess, a question raised a number of times in terms of trying to improve their wastewater treatment system to meet a harmonization of the 2525 that I've been discussing. And, and this is really, I guess, a logistical, well, and a capital and a a uh, operation and maintenance cost perspective is, in, is posing the, really posing the question that because of this this dispersion or the natural environment that has this huge dispersion opportunity is in fact a secondary treatment system ultimately needed what has had in fact happened over the last several years is that fort simpson has improved their sewage treatment to i think using a membrane system so they are for all practical purposes, discharging to the 2525 mandate under the harmonization. And this has required a, a capital cost investment, I think of somewhere around five to $7 million. And then their operation costs have sort of gone up and they're probably in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Fort Smith wastewater system is very much similar to or in terms of a circumstance is very much similar to the town or the village of Fort Simpson is that 
Fort Smith discharges to the Slave River, and they are in a similar sort of discharge regime is that the flow of the Slave River, which, they're, which, they, which they discharge system, is, has a dispersion rate of probably two or 300,000 to one, but they're also discharging into a very, what is a muddy river. So in terms of an environmental impact, it has been well argued that for, for them to improve their effluent quality to the harmonization limits of 25-25 would really be uh, not a, a potentially practical solution to the problem, but rather study more or, or into the actual dispersion uh, or the capacity of the receiving water environment. And as it has, at least to date, turned out is that they have been able to, I guess, make the argument or the, the statement that of going from the system now, which is a primary lagoon system with a secondary lagoon system and discharging into the Slave River, that th that process technology is is appropriate for the receiving environment they have. And in this slide, you can you actually this next slide you can see the comparison of the water and technology based. So the parameters of going down and the the water based or the receiving water based quality is is quite a bit different than the technology based water. Another sort of curse is that the, the Dawson City wastewater treatment system. Certainly you can see from these slides that the effluent quality of their system over the, the course of the year is generally satisfactory to meet the effluent quality guidelines or, the, or generally a, a good effluent quality guidelines, but certainly not necessarily meeting the 25-25. But what is, what is unique to Dawson is for freeze protection, they're actually injecting water into their sewer system from November through May. So they're actually getting a dilution over the course of the year. But what is, what is also interesting, and you can see in one of the um, pictures on the slide, is that they're discharging to a point of, into a Yukon River, which has a potentially high flow, but it is also a really sediment, has a, has a large sediment load in the river, so if so, and it has been studied and uh, I'm going to say not, not necessarily proven, but certainly presented that in fact the discharge, the environmental impact of the discharge of sewage to Dawson City, and it's currently it was at a primary level of of treatment was doing mo no more impact on the fishery than in the Yukon River itself with its large sediment load. Certainly, what has happened since that time and this over the last. 10 years that they have gone to a, a secondary treatment system just because the regulators insisted and actually it went to a, it was under a court order to do that. Another sort of disadvantage or curse is that uh, with the implementation of these potentially or the harmonized environment in the Inuit regions of Northern Canada has has some significant impacts overall in terms of the Inuit communities. And a, a report was done that said that to implement this system was going to cost, I think, several billion dollars to implement, it, which in, in the roughly, I think, 60 broad communities, uh, Inuit communities in the Canadian North, but even more significant to that was the operation and maintenance costs is that for a mechanical system, whether it's worth $5 million, $10 million, $20 million, is that the operation maintenance costs are not in the tens of thousands, but generally in the hundreds of thousands and larger. And this creates a very significant burden on the community. And in addition to that is that the community must maintain the human resources to operate the systems. And certainly that requires another burden on the community in terms of training and maintaining these resources that can function with the with the system it was certainly recognized by the government of canada with the harmonization that there would be some special considerations for the canadian north and there was some i guess not written potential for relaxation and this was was going by of having the opportunity for improvement in the wastewater systems that would go in the north but also the have a flexible Im implementation period. And certainly the, the government of Canada 
needs to be given credit for having this provision potentially in the harmonization. Another potential aspect of this was the actual rolling out of it. As I mentioned that um, there was some a timeline that may be more appropriate to the community instead of having to do it within five years, maybe they, they could do it within 15. But another aspect of it is, is the site specific considerations that certainly the community of Akalawit, which has a population of 8,000 people that's discharging into the ocean, has a much more sig potential significant impact than the community of Greece Fjord, which is several thousand kilometers further north and has a population of 150 people. And this was an already a point that I'd mentioned before in terms of environmental risk assessment or site specific in the case of Dawson City is that they're discharging into the Yukon River and there's a strong argument from a environmental impact perspective on fisheries is that given the the characteristics of the discharge in the Yukon River being a high sediment load is that the impact of a sewage discharge may not necessarily require that they treat to a, a secondary quality of effluent. And probably not, not necessarily the bigger picture, but just I guess, a, I guess a general picture in terms of government is that having implementing solutions that are physically responsible and sustainable. And I think that one of the bigger examples of this is, is Dawson City is that it has a population of 2,500 people and the system that was implemented t 10 years ago and was commissioned in 2012 has cost over $30 million for a population of 2,500. And certainly it's been argued and actually even been suggested by some people at the, uh, at the various levels of government that this is not necessarily a physically responsible solution in terms of money spent, our, our Canadian taxpayers' money spent for sewage treatment. So this has entered the picture as, as well as, as sort of an argument as to why the harmonization or, or what sh the limitations on the harmonization should be for Northern Canada. In conclusion, so what uh, I've, I've tried to present here is that there's a significant gap associated with between re regulatory requirements and reasonable practices for communities in the North as it applies to wastewater treatment. The um, a really significant and aspect of it is the social impact is that these potentially sophisticated technologies that are going to meet these effluent quality criteria present a, a burden on the community or a legacy on the community that generally lasts somewhere between 20 and 30 years. Because if you build a system, it's, it won't have to be replaced for another 20 to 30 years. So the, the community has this burden that they must cope with in terms of the operation and maintenance cost but also the human, re human resource costs of maintaining the, the people to actually operate and maintain the system. The end. <laughs>